Hey y'all, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Katrina and this is I have finally finished Rethinking Incarceration. Uh, this is a continuation of my trying to educate myself on prison abolishment. And this book took a long time because it kind of read like a horror story at first a lot a lot of the statistics and things like that were quite harrowing this book also was really good about leading me to more books so all the blue tabs are just marking other resources that i'm going to look up eventually the books that i have been reading you know end of policing our prisons obsolete and then um these they, I was hoping that this would be a little bit more of a solution based book and this one went a little bit deeper and it talks a lot about the Protestant religious uh, backgrounds of it because this is a theologian who, who is writing about this fr from a position of the church failing uh, its call to reach out and take care of the poor, the, the, the widow, the fatherless and the prisoner and that the church has lost its way. And the, the reason why I found it important to, to look at the theological point of view when it came to pr prison reform and, and police reform is because a lot of the strides that we have made in this country have been through a theological lens, through a church, through a calling on a higher power you know just thinking of the Reverend Martin Luther King jr. and you know his his push to call on the moral center of the country through the lens of it claiming to be a Christian nation and that's a little tricky now because we're not necessarily uh, a Christian nation in this, but we still see ourselves that way. Um, but we are more and more unchurched and things like that. But I still thought it was important to look at it through that way because the church is the one who still has a lot of the um, uh, infrastructure that is going in and uh, prisons through chaplains and programs like that and and halfway houses and, and the like this book also is much more personal one of the things that kind of made it chilling and he would give specific examples of the fact that in our country we in 13 states we will try children as adults and that has led to children as young as eight being put in prison with adults and I remember at that point I had to put the book down for a very long time because my seven-year-old was turning eight that that month here here is something that was interesting to me and it really brings home the idea that I was just saying how this book makes it personal in some areas and it also goes deeper into the the root the foundation of why policing and prisons and mass incarceration is a rotten thing that is so uh, endemic and it needs to needs to be completely rooted out. It's like there's no it's not a bad apple in the bunch. It, it is the tree. It is the root. It is the foundation. And so that's one of the other things that we don't realize when we incarcerate someone, it's not just the incarceration, it's the continued control over their lives and the continue making them a second class citizen. They can't vote, they can't move about the country freely and it harkens back to black codes and things like that where um, anything a black person does was you know, potentially uh, illegal. The one thing also that I think was interesting about this book was uh, the other books a lot of times focused a little bit more on people who were innocent. Uh, so focused on the Innocence Project, the injustice of jailing people for drugs. He actually also talks about people who we would be punished. And this is one of the things that he talks about. And this is from Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy and Just Stevenson writes, the power of just mercy is that it belongs to the undeserving. 
It's when mercy is least expected that it is most potent, strong enough to break the cycle of victimization and victimhood, retribution and suffering. It has the power to heal the psychic harm and injuries that lead to aggression and violence, abuse of power, and mass incarceration. One of the things that this book did too is um, it connected to uh, what Angela Davis said in Our Prisons Obsolete. Obsolete. And it said, um, this is the author himself talking about the change that needed to happen in his mind. I needed to explore what needed to change within me before thinking how I could minister to those I was asked to teach and lead. He was being asked to teach in the prison ministry. And the problem is that um, those most of us, even people who come from a Christian background or come from a progressive point of view or a humanist point of view, see prisoners as less than human, that they deserve the mistreatment that we get. And, you know, we see that in the greater society because we, uh, we don't allow jokes we don't allow people to get away with racist jokes, but it's still okay to joke about someone being raped in prison and the like. And so we've decided that they weren't human or they gave up their rights to be human when they made a mistake. And so this is one of the things that he said he, he needed to change. And Angela Davis says that as well, that we need to critically think about how we see our fellow human being examine the bloodlust that we have when it comes to uh, a criminal. Um, when a person commits a, a, an act a, against another person um, that is criminal, do we want justice or do we want vengeance? And I would argue, and many of these people argue, that Americans want vengeance. But this is his, this theologian's, um, and a pastor, uh, this is his thesis uh, of the book and it's offered in a prayer. Um, I pray it awakens the church to the tragic realities of mass incarceration and inspires us to envision and work toward a justice system predicated on reconciliation, restoration, and reintegration. I hope this book makes clear that mass incarceration will not end via legislative tweaks and incremental reform. Mass incarceration will be halted only by a moral awakening Citizens nationwide must refuse to remain silent while entire communities are stigmatized, targeted, and destroyed by a system preying on the least of these. Now, um, Dominique Dubois Gilliard also reiterates what both The End of Policing and Our Prisons Obsolete say in the fact that the majority of people that are in jail are for unjust drug laws. And uh, here we go. Only 15% of drug users at the time were black, and the same is roughly true today. Studies have shown that whites are more likely to use and deal drugs. White youth in particular are seven times more likely to use cocaine and heroin than black youth, and are three times more likely to sell drugs. Despite, despite this fact, African Americans represent the vast majority of drug offenders sent to prison. And it, you know, that control being put on us started with the black codes and it is, it's still uh, evident today. You know, black people were free from slavery. Uh, black co codes were enacted to be able to jail black people and control them as much as possible. And then those people were able to be rented back out to plantations to work for free again. It still happens like, you know, with the stop and frisk situations, the fact that black people are over policed in the sense that they will uh, be stopped by the police for broken tail lights or things hanging from their mirrors, just any reason to pull them aside. So the, the over policing of black people is another reason why black people end up in jail more. And then you have people thinking, well, the people who are committing the most crimes are the black people. And it's like, no, we're the ones who are coming in contact with police and, and just our very being is uh, considered criminal. Douglas Blackman, who wrote Slavery by Another Name, explains the black codes as this. Across the South, the state legislatures of every state passed laws that begun effectively to criminalize criminalized black life and to create a situation in which African-American men found it almost impossible not to be in violation of some misdemeanor statute at almost all times. And this one struck me because this 
we talk about cultural memory a lot when it talk when we talk about trauma, the trauma of, of Native Americans and of Black people and uh, Holocaust survivors. But there is a cultural memory that's passed down. I am convinced. You know, we've been hearing a lot about Karens and the fact that they get in people's business and call the police on people and things like that. This is one of the black codes. It shall be the duty of every citizen to act as a police officer for the detection of offenses and the apprehension of offenders who shall be immediately handed over to the proper captain or chief of patrol. And I wrote really, really um, uh, in capital letters, Karens. Bringing it back to the churches, I don't know, criminalizing the, the, the least of these and not taking care of them. Here is a statement that he brings up from a man named Foucault. Uh, Foucault names the a lamentable com component of the church's legacy. Christianity has consistently been misused to, legitim to legitimate exclusion. Misappropriated faith has been used to create a buffer between us and them, between the moral citizens and the criminals, the cognitively impaired and those without, or the have and the have-nots. The fact that many people link exclusion to the church and our definition of salvation is heartbreaking. It illuminates our flawed natures as fallible human beings and our inability to fully comprehend God's reconciling work in the world and our role in it. And he talks, he goes on to talk about the fact that prisons have become the new asylums, um, that prison, uh, that mental health has been racialized. And in this pivotal moment, the church must collectively support the reallocation of medical funding. The clear majority of the people with mental impairment serving time need treatment, not incarceration. We cannot continue to incarcerate people who do not have the mental capacities to understand what they're being sent sentenced for. This is unethical and immoral. So we have two groups of people now, um, three actually, who are in prison, who are taking up uh, the majority of the space in prisons that shouldn't be there. We continue to ignore the injustice of it by saying, what about the rapists and the murderers? And there's such a small portion of who is in, in prison, children and the poor, the mentally ill, and people who are addicted um, and not seeing that as a medical issue and also not seeing that as a societal issue. What is someone trying to escape from when they are, you know, taking drugs and trying to numb whatever pain that they're in? Now, a large portion of this book that is different than the other book because it is a uh, Christian-focused book talks about a puritanical uh, basis for incarceration that started in Europe and came here with uh, the people who came, you know, Puritans and things like that, and their very harsh way of uh, seeing God and punishment and sin and things like that. So he gives a very in-depth history on that, and I'm part of why we do prison the way we do prison. And, and it's interesting because uh, they were the extreme of, of Christians, and that's the reason why they were kicked out or left Europe, um, the Puritans. And so for them to have such a, a impact on our prison system still and the churches and, you know, just the regular American, you know, who is culturally Christian idea about mercy and justice and restorative versus retributive justice and all that kind of stuff is um, interesting. Now, this red dot thing up here, I'm going to read a, a, a lot of stuff that he has to say because it talks, we, we focus so much. Um, the church in Christianity and as much as we try to say that we are a secular society, we focus on these things in our society and we don't realize how much uh, the Protestant way of uh, thinking about good and evil affects our laws and the like. And so that's why I think it's also important to read these books as well, not just because of my, my thought process of the church being a vehicle toward justice, because it has been in the past, it's been an effective way uh, forward in justice in the past. Uh, I also feel like 
we still operate off of a Protestant uh, view of good and evil, even those of us who um, maybe atheists or, or agnostic, a lot of our laws are still predicated on the Ten Commandments and a, a Judeo-Christian frame framework. It is vitally important the two domains, social and criminal justice, are not viewed in splendid isolation, especially when seeking to apply biblical insights and priorities to our context. Much of what the Bible says about social justice is a direct relevance to the criminal justice domain. If we took more serious the biblical imperative to care for the poor and dispossessed, to avoid unjust accumulation of wealth and power in the hands of the few, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed by debt or ex exploitation, we would have less cause to employ criminal sanctions against those on the margins of community who feel they have no stake in society. Justice like faith is both individual and social. Accordingly, biblical justice requires the church to protect the dignity and the livelihood of the least of these, ensuring that governments, systems, and structures are not preying on or exploiting the weak, lowly, and marginalized. Brian Stevenson, the author of Just Mercy, was he said that we treat the rich and guilty better than we treat the poor and innocent. And so, you know, and, and that's the case. We criminalize those that are already down on their luck. Make things difficult for someone who already was born into something difficult. And then when they inevitably break this law, because there's so so many ways for them to break the law, Think, you know, just so many ways that they can come in contact with the police that white people would never come in contact with the police for. Then they're put in jail and there's all these fees and all of these things that make it even worse even for, for them to survive. And then they inevitably, you know, commit another crime because their life is made so difficult we're doing that to them. We're inflicting that on them. And that is the reason why this is an, an important book, even for someone who is not religious necessarily. It's because our laws are being framed by the religious right. And so he's appealing to that group of people and educating those who might not understand that this is the reason why our country is the way it is. Uh, the Hebrew word for justice is mishpat. It occurs more than 200 times in the Old Testament. It means impartiality and equitably punishing people for relational vi uh, violations and ensuring people's rights. It means giving people what they're due. It involves advocating for the vulnerable and giving them care and protection. Widows, orphans, immigrants, and the poor are some of the most vulnerable and impoverished groups mentioned in the Old Testament. God is described as their primary defender. God is the father to the fatherless, the defender of the widows. Uh, he identifies with these groups to the point where God says that when we neglect, disrespect, or forsake the least of these, we are doing the same to God. Now, if we translate that to modern day society, that tells us that if we are not taking care of our people, which we do not do here in America, we do not you know it's 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 a nation it's a worldwide shame that we do not care for um the least of these in our country we are the most powerful country that has ever um existed in history yet we're the only ones who do not provide a safety net for our people restorative justice never diminishes the significance of a violation a violation or a crime. It summons all parties affected to collectively determine how to heal, repair, and restore relationships after the violation. It prioritizes disrupting cycles of harm and violence by creating pathways for healing and restoration. Restorative justice acknowledges that the crime damages the perpetrator's relationship with the victim, the victim's community, the perpetrator's own community, and the perpetrator. It also acknowledges that the uh, offender's responsibility to help meet the needs of the victim is restoring relation, relationship and community. 
I need more of this. I need like a whole book that talks about these alternative methods and it's always kind of tacked on at the end. And even though it seems like this is not the end of the book, a lot of this is acknowledgements um, and notes. So it really is tacked on. This is the end of the book. Over the past 40 years, restorative justice has an impressive global track record in criminal justice reform educational systems, and addressing broader societal trauma. Restorative justice has created alternatives to, to traditional legal processes, restoring relationships and creating communal healing. It has helped eliminate juvenile detention facilities in New England. It is also used to address racial conflict and gang violence in Rio de Janeiro. Restorative justice uh, was also used to facilitate national healing in post-apartheid South Africa and post-genocide Rwanda. Now he addresses the critiques about restorative justice being so soft on crime by saying this. This is important because some critique restorative justice as soft on crime. However, even within restorative approaches, at times an offender does need to be removed from the community to reflect, learn from, and change in light of the violation. Nonetheless, as we see here, there must be a reintegration plan. Presently, many individuals serve their time and then cannot successfully reintegrate into communities because they are stripped of their dignity, labeled as ex-cons, deprived of voting rights, and denied liberties and freedoms that enable them to flourish. So one of the final things he says is, as people marked by God's grace, we must lead the charge in advocating for another way. Michelle Alexander writes, as a society, our decision to heap shame and contempt upon those who struggle and fail in a system designed to keep them locked up and locked out says far more about ourselves than it does them. Knowing that the roots of our system of justice is inherently unjust in so many ways should cause us to rethink to stop and um, reevaluate the way we look at things, the way we look at justice, the way we look at how we would want our children treated if they were to do a heinous crime. We would want them to be sent somewhere to be able to reflect and then to be restored and helped and changed and then be reintegrated into society and how everyone should be afforded that. We, sh we need to, especially as some as people who call themselves Christians or progressives, we need to stop othering people. We need to stop seeing the immigrants as illegal. We need to stop seeing black people as criminals or less than or different. We need to stop seeing social justice as a bad word and see it as something that should be the basis, the root of our criminal system, our criminal justice system. It, we don't look for justice. We look for retaliation and vengeance. And I sit at the middle of the, the, the non-religious and the very religious. I am in the middle. I am not super religious and I'm not an atheist. And I still found that this book was um, extremely important and extremely helpful for the reasons that I explained. Number one, most of the action that has taken place specifically for black people, because um, there has been on the ground work for labor movements, um, you know, migrant workers and things like that, that wasn't rooted in the church. But specifically for black people, the church was a nexus for organizing and Martin Luther King specifically being able to um, appeal to uh, what we call a Christian nation, even though we were not supposed to be any sort of religion. Um, he was able to use the language of the culturally Christian to appeal to, you know, the hearts and minds of the majority of people to start moving the needle uh, towards justice. And so thanks for uh, sticking through and listening. If you got to the end of this, uh, use this emoji. Be easy on yourself and I will see you in the next